Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Does this work? Yes? Great. Thank you, Sebastian. It's a privilege uh, and an honor to be with you this afternoon and to be able to you know, moderate, discuss, share with you uh, the incredible, remarkable panel that we have today. I think it's useful also to start with a question. You know, the first question we all may have is, what is innovation? You know, we all agree innovation is key. You know, innovation is essential to the future of our industry, to the future of our business. But as Sebastian says, we could probably discuss for a year and not find a consensus of what is innovation about. So I'd like to offer to you a definition of innovation that is broad enough that I think will cover all the topics that we have today and that really focuses on the end point of innovation. So today we're going to look at innovation as anything new or novel that creates or adds new value. So you could say, you know, creativity, all the great ideas, if they don't find a market, if they don't go all the way to actually demonstrating value, you know, maybe we can question that that's really innovation. So that's what we'll be looking at this afternoon. Products, services, processes that create or add new value. Sometimes it's not new to the world, sometimes it is, as you'll find, you know, you'll hear from our speakers some really incredible uh, adventures that they've taken on but you know, creating new value for someone. Then we can ask ourselves, so this afternoon we're going to be answering the questions, why do we innovate? You know, what's the point is the whole topic of the afternoon. And then we're going to also look at who are we innovating for? You know, we're innovating for patients, you could say, ultimately in this whole industry, but you know, not only. So we'll be looking at who are we innovating for and then how do we innovate and what are the different challenges, what are the obstacles, what did we need to overcome to be able to innovate? And you'll hear you know, really great stories this afternoon, the very practical um, challenges and successes. We're going to start soon with our keynote speaker, J Professor James Barlow, and I'll say a little bit more to introduce James, uh, to give you an idea of the flow of the afternoon. So first we'll hear from Professor James Barlow, who's going to really set the stage and give us a quite comprehensive perspective on you know, why do we even want to need to innovate. And then after James um, is finished with his presentation, we will enable you to engage in the conversation and have a Q&A answer for 15, 20 minutes. So you know, that, jot down your thoughts as you listen to James' presentation, write down any ideas, you know, see where you can connect the dots, and then we'll have some time for that after the presentation. Then we'll take a break. And during the break, that's the first opportunity to you know, learn, debate, and network. So really start connecting with each other, you know, start to share what are some of your challenges, some of your innovation successes and difficulties. And we're very lucky because the sun's out. So at that stage, you know, we can mingle in the garden. There, we'll come back at 5.30. And at 5.30, we will hear from each of the presenters. So our five pre uh, presenters this afternoon, five speakers. And at the end, have a panel, round table, and Q&A session. So once again, be prepared during the afternoon to you know, write down notes, jot down questions, you know, things that you really, really want to ask from our, from our speakers. And then we'll all come back on stage and have that uh, panel, panel and Q&A session. And at the very end, we'll leave some time for our speakers to wrap up and share with you some of their like, key thoughts. You know, what is the that the last few words that they want to leave you with, and then I'll hand it back over to Sebastian to, to uh, wrap it up at 7.30, but that's not the end. From 7.30 to until late, I think it says in the agenda, so <laughs> that's great. How late? And we'll see. You know, as, late as, as late as you like. So you know, again, connect, learn, debate, network. So that's the opportunity to really continue to mingle with cocktails and um, you know, meet as many people as you can, continue the dialogue and the conversations with the speakers, engage with each other. And so that will be up until you know, as long as you can stay and uh, would like to stay. So that's the flow of the afternoon. Now, before um, you know, I we start really engaging this, I'd also like to invite you to listen in a particular way. You know, if you're like me, sometimes you come to conferences like this and you kind of come with a utilitarian kind of, you know, mindset like, hmm, what will I learn that's useful to me? Or, and we listen for what we already know, oh, this topic's not for me, you know, I don't know anything about big data, or I, oh, I'm only interested in big data. 
And if you take on an innovator's perspective, everything is interesting for you. So it's really looking at what can you learn? Where can you connect dots from themes, ideas, people that have nothing to do with your business? And you'll see that that's also a key part of innovation is being able to look outside of your industry, being able to look outside of your function, outside of your department, and connect the dots. So you know, listen for what's the value here? Where are the gold nuggets? What am I learning? What can I steal? You know, it doesn't have to be all new to the world what you're innovating about. So what can you take on and steal? And you know, I think I really recommend that. I think that's how you, you will really get the most value from all of the conversations and exchanges we'll have this afternoon. Great. So our first speaker will be Professor James Barlow. James is Professor of Technology and Innovation Management at Imperial College Business School and Associate Director of Research and Evaluation for Imperial College Health Partners. James has spent more than 20 years working on innovation in healthcare from different angles, mainly trying to understand the challenges of getting innovation adopted by health systems. And as you know, all of you, I'm, I'm sure, have faced challenges of adoption of innovation in your in your area of expertise, in your industry, in your company. And James has also just published a book on managing innovation in healthcare. So James will share with us a broad overview of innovation in healthcare, why we need new thinking, you know, what's the point, and where is this new thinking coming from? And then we'll have some time, as I said earlier, for questions at uh, the end of his talk. Now. Um, Something you know, interesting to know about Professor James Barlow is that beyond his 20 years of academic studies and research in the field of innovation, he has been a disruptor and an innovator very early on. And how, how we found this out was that in 1976, if we're allowed to say dates, you know, <laughs> in 1976, James was actually playing in a punk band. No? Quite interesting background for an academic, but it certainly demonstration of curiosity, of being willing to disrupt and, you know, to shift the boundaries and stick, stand out also at a time where, you know, it was pretty disruptive to be playing punk music. And I think we even know that there's a song someplace on an album, but we haven't quite found that one yet. So there's the book and there's the record. You, know? <laughs> you can choose. So please join me in welcoming Professor James Barlow, our first speaker. Yes, I, I won't give you the link to the, uh, the song. It's too embarrassing. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. You'll try to share it, yeah. Um, yes, no, it was... Well, actually, I, I, I really like that music in the, from the 70s now, which we were trying to disrupt. I think all, the, all that disco stuff from the 70s is great. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, we, you know, things come in cycles, don't they? Um, so, um, merci beaucoup, Marie-Caroline. Marie Caroline, uh, Sébastien, Annette, tout le monde. Je suis très content d'être à Paris. Um, but I will speak in English. Um, <laughs> um, my French is, is OK, but it's a bit rusty. Um, so I think my, my role really is in the next sort of 30 minutes uh, just to try and um, uh, get you thinking about this question, um, innovation in healthcare, what's the point? Um, and I was a little thrown when I saw the title because I, I hadn't quite taken that on board when you, uh, you asked me to speak at this conference. Um, but, but I think what, what I'm going to say does fit into that, um, that, that, that title of the, uh, of, of the conference. Um, because what I really want to do is just to kick things off by getting you to try and think about um, some of the big global health challenges uh, that require new innovative thinking. But Really importantly, I think, I, I want to leave you with the idea that um, innovation does mean different things, and uh, it's not just about science and technology. And um, actually, a lot of the change and a lot of the real benefit, I think, from innovation in years to come is going to come f certainly from science and technology, but really also from organizational change and um, new business models, new service delivery models, and so on. Um, so... Um, so that's, that's the aim. So I've got 30 minutes. Um, and there we are, slides are down here. Um, um, there we go. Um, so where's the new thinking coming from? And I think the first thing I want to do is just to remind ourselves um, what these big global challenges are. Um, 
And, I mean, these are all familiar to you, so we don't need to spend time on them. But, first of all, there's an epidemiological transition going on, a shift from uh, the, the, the kind of tr traditional infectious diseases, which were major problems in much of the world, all the world, previously, towards new types of um, uh, 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 health problem, um, chronic diseases, but also things like um, uh, uh, road accidents. I mean, road accidents is a major, major global health challenge, which actually does need innovative thinking. So we've got this epidemiological transition. Um, some parts of the world have got the problem of the burden of both types of condition, the, the old infectious diseases and the new chronic diseases as well, which are beginning to bear down on their countries. So, so the, 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 the kind of pattern of um, morbidity is changing, first point. Um, aging, of course, is, is, is a huge, huge issue. Um, something like a, a, a billion extra people aged over 60 um, in, um, over the next 35 years. Um, uh, uh, 60 is not old. I, I had my 60th birthday uh, in January, so I don't consider myself to be old. But um, within that billion, um, and I forget the, the figure now, but um, a substantial and growing proportion of people aged over 85. So, so um, sorry, okay. Is this, this, is this one working? Okay, right. Um, so the old, old, within that aging population are, again, a big, big challenge for health and social care systems. Um, uh, chronic disease uh, and diseases associated with uh, lifestyle and, uh, and in particular obesity uh, is again another huge issue. Um, 2.1 billion additional people um, by I think it's in the next 35 years and um, uh, you know a huge problem for, 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 for health systems. Um, and then there are um, the big unknowns as well. So, so we know about the epidemiological transition, we know about ageing, we know about obesity, but then there are also the unknowns as well. Um, antimicrobial resistance um, and climate change. Um, certainly climate change is beginning to have an impact in terms of the spread of uh, conditions which um, perhaps had previously been eradicated from some parts of the world, but are beginning to reappear, dengue fever there. Um, and AMR, antimicrobial resistance, um, the O'Neill report, uh, Jim O'Neill from Golden Sachs was commissioned to do a report for the UK government um, a year or so ago, estimated that um, AMR um, antibiotic resistance could cost the world's health systems $100 trillion by, uh, by 2050. And of course, that's not just about money, that's about lives as well. And I think it's, uh, it's estimated within that report that there could be 11 million people a year uh, dying from um, from antibiotic resistance in the next oh, by, by 2050. Um, so those are the big, big, big challenges uh, which all health systems are facing, and that's where the innovation imperative is coming from. I would argue, uh, you know, we, we need new thinking to deal with that. But the way that's playing out is slightly different depending on which part of the world you're in, uh, what lens you look at it through. Um, and certainly here in France, um, in the UK, in the rest of Europe, in the US, um, in developed countries' health systems, it's largely about resources and money and, and, and people and rising demand. And how you cope with this perfect storm of an aging population and therefore growing health needs, um, but constrained resources, uh, and that's medical personnel, but it's money as well. You know, we want the best possible health systems in the world and social care systems and pension systems in the world, but we don't want to pay more tax for them. Um, so, so we have this, this problem of, of, of money, and um, there's... Uh, uh, President Obama introducing Obamacare. You know, we, 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 if we don't do something with the health system, we'll just go the way of General Motors. We, we, we'll end up uh, paying more and, and, and getting less uh, and going broke. Um, so, big challenge, and it's just as much an issue here in France as it is in the UK, where um, the estimated funding gap 
between available spending, available resources on the National Health Service, um, assuming we don't spend a lot more of our tax money on the NHS in the next 10 years or so, uh, the gap between what's available to spend and what the actual need might be could be anything between 20 billion and 60 billion pounds per year, that is. That's not some cumulative total, that's annual annually. So huge challenges around how you deliver care within that changing, uh, tightening context. So that's the developed countries' health systems. Um, if we look at developing parts of the world, low to middle income countries, um, a lot of the question here is about access. It's about improving access to health care services within resource constraints. Um, and uh, I, I, I like that because it's, uh, it came from a report on uh, shortages of, um, and surpluses of health care workers in different countries. And um, what that basically shows is the, the, the countries where the biggest shortage of health workers are and the ones where the, 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 the lowest shortage. Now, I, I know in France and I know in the UK and the US you know, that there are shortages of doctors and nurses, but um, compared to South Asia and, and, and um, Africa, you know, it's, 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 there's no comparison. And actually there is a correlation between the two because, of course, a lot of people move from those countries to the developed ones to, to work. So resource constraints and uh, the difficulties of providing access to good quality care when you're faced with that are the big issue in uh, developing parts of the world. Um, but also um, uh, there's the ambition to deliver universal coverage to uh, um, the population increase the range of services that are provided, increase the number of people who get access to health care at an affordable cost, um, and, and, and increase the proportion of, um, of the population that's covered. That's the ambition in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals for the UN. That's what countries are thinking about in developing parts of the world. And of course, innovation is needed to deal with universal coverage. Um, so we need innovation, but my next point really is that we've got a bit stuck with innovation in healthcare, and um, we, we need new thinking about what we mean by innovation. And in particular, we need to address three things, three, three barriers, three, three issues, um, which are problems, I think for those of us thinking about innovation in healthcare and trying to deliver innovation in healthcare. And I'll go through each of these in a moment, but it's the innovation productivity problem. Um, and I know that you know, a lot of people in the room are from life sciences industries, biotech and, and pharma, and some people from med tech. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Certainly there are issues around the productivity of research and development in those sectors. Um, but possibly even more importantly, there's an innovation adoption problem in any country you really get, you, you really come to. As you all know, it's one thing creating the new innovations, it's another matter getting them actually taken up in practice. And then lastly, there's what I've called the innovation paradox, which is really a question around um, the costs and benefits of innovation in healthcare compared to innovation perhaps in, in other sectors, in other industries. So I'll just quickly go through each of those. Um, so first of all, science is not the problem. Um, uh, different estimates around, I mean, everybody says, you know, the pace of knowledge and, and change in the knowledge, in knowledge about medicine is immensely rapid. Different estimates up there on the screen about how quickly our knowledge about um, life sciences and, and medicine doubles. You know, most people reckon it's every five years or so. Um, who knows? Um, and probably we can't actually ever measure it actually. But anyway, the science is not really the problem. There's, there's lots of science out there, and lots of it goes on at my university, at Imperial College. Um, but of course, as we all know, the science 
doesn't necessarily translate into new products, um, <coughs> new medical devices, new drugs, um, which, which are actually capable of being adopted into mainstream practice within healthcare services. And um, those are quite old, those, those figures. I couldn't find a more recent one. But uh, yeah, and I don't need to tell you about the, the sort of increasing amount of research and development uh, uh, funding that goes into the pharmaceutical sector or, or basic drug research and uh, less and less coming out of the pipeline at the other end. We, we may be turning, a, turning that around a little bit now. I've certainly seen some different figures on um, the number of new, uh, new drugs coming out of that pipeline. Um, um, we can talk about that later. But certainly there's been an innovation productivity problem within the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and you can't get comparable data from med tech because it's so diverse anyway. But I suspect probably you'd see the same sort of problem as well. So there's a sort of productivity issue here. Um, but possibly even more important than that, there is the research translation gap. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean the ability to turn that science, that, that basic research, into potential innovations, new products, new, new drugs, new devices, for example, but actually get those taken up and adopted into mainstream everyday practice within health systems. Um, and again, there are various estimates of how long it takes to get a new uh, healthcare innovation adopted. Uh, once it's being, once it's been created, trialled, you know, licensed perhaps if it needs to be, it can still take uh, possibly as much as 17 years. That, that's the number of studies, this is a meta-analysis of different studies. Um, 17 years from, um, uh, for, uh, which is the time lag for adoption. So, and I'm sure, I don't need to tell you, uh, you know, you've, I'm sure you've been there, you've done it, you know how difficult it, it is to get new drugs taken up um, or new medical technologies. Um, so we have a huge issue around the flow of innovations through that pipeline into mainstream everyday practice. And there are a lot of reasons for that, which we, you know, may come out in the discussion later, but um, you know, there's regulation, there's payment and reimbursement, there's the complexity of a lot of innovations. I mean, quite a lot of medical devices, for example, are not actually the technology. It's what's wrapped around them. It's the organisational change, it's the service delivery change, it's the business models and so on. And that's why they're very difficult to get taken up into an immensely complex environment, which is healthcare. Um, so we have a translation problem, um, and um, and you know d different countries are. Some countries are better than others at taking up new innovations. Um, we're trying to do some work at the moment uh, to develop a global um, innovation index, uh, for a healthcare innovation index for for, for countries. Um, there are global innovation indices in general, so to say that France is, you know, number 10, UK's number 8, you know, Switzerland's number 5, but nobody's done that for healthcare, so we're trying to do that at the moment. Um, I've got a meeting at the OECD tomorrow about that. Um, but um, one thing we've been looking at is some sort of tracer innovations. Um, uh, uh, um, innovative devices, innovative drugs, which are evidence-based, which, you know, everybody agrees should be adopted. And uh, it's quite interesting just seeing the different uh, rates at which countries adopt those innovations. France comes out actually in, in these two particular innovations as being an early adopter um, um, in, in uh, particularly in statins. Um, I'd like to hear from you why that's the case. Um, but you know you can see the familiar sort of S-shaped adoption curve there. Things start slowly, ramp up, then they tail off. But I mean, the point is, those are years down the bottom, and it can take a very long time for countries to, 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 to adopt a new healthcare innovation. Um, that's the developed world, and of course, in developing countries, there are also other problems as well. Um, so um, this is from a report we did for the Lancet. Um, uh, 
four or five years ago. Um, and, you know, sometimes the technology just isn't available. It, it hasn't been developed. Um, but often it exists, but it's not appropriate for that country. It needs um, an infrastructure for it to be taken up, whether it's training or whether it's, you know, stable electricity supply, stable, you know, availability of water or whatever. Um, or it's just, it's, it's bought and then it's, it's gathering dust in a cupboard. So many, many issues around the right kind of technology for resource poor parts of the world, the, the ones I mentioned right at the beginning. Um, so there's an adoption issue in developing countries, but it's perhaps slightly different from, from, from here. Um, so, um, last, so, so I've talked about productive, the research and development productivity. I've talked about the adoption question. Um, and um, last point I'm, I was going to make in this little segment was about um, this, this paradox of uh, um, uh, cost inflation associated with innovations and in healthcare. Um, now, you know, we all know that um, our mobile phones get better and better every year. Um, they don't necessarily get cheaper, but, you know, you get a lot more for your money. Your laptop computer is way in advance of, of um, you know, what was available 10 years ago for a fraction of the price. Uh, you know, we're used to the idea that technological innovation drives down cost and expands a market that way. Well, the problem with healthcare is that that's actually not necessarily the case. And um, it's not the case for a number of reasons. Um, it, but predominantly, when you're bringing in new technological innovations in healthcare, they're actually allowing you to do more things, treat more people treat people who previously couldn't be treated, they're older people perhaps, you know, we can operate on very elderly people now. Um, the innovation itself may be more expensive than what it's replacing. Um, um, it needs training. You need to run the old model with the innovative model at the same time whilst you're <coughs> winding down the old, old model and ramping up the new one. So. Technological innovation in healthcare doesn't necessarily save you money um, overall as a health system or as a tax taxpayer or as a government or as an insurance uh, company. Um, again, different estimates. Economists love you know, playing around with the numbers, but certainly in the US, it's been estimated that between about a quarter and um, getting on for half of all the cost inflation in the US health system since the 1960s has been associated with the adoption of new technological innovations. And that's great for you and me, you know, we get better health care, we get great treatment, you know, better drugs, better operations, minimally invasive surgery, but it's got to be paid for. Um, so I'll come back to this in a moment. So, so, so there is this slight difference, I think, between the way innovation, technological innovation works in healthcare compared to some other sectors of the economy. Um, so, where is this new thinking coming from? And let me just spend the next five, final five minutes or so just sort of uh, going through some thoughts and really just hopefully setting up some of the discussion later on where I think we need to focus our attention when it comes to innovation in, um, in healthcare. Um, so first of all, this point about uh, productivity of our R&D and, 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 and you know, the, the flow of new ideas coming through the pipeline from the, the, the initial research. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm sure you, you're fully aware of all this and you're involved in this deeply, I'm sure. Um, you know, lots of talk about new innovation models, um, moving towards more open innovation models, uh, you know, sourcing ideas from, from outside the company, um, finding the right vehicles for, for, for doing that. Um, so open innovation is, is what everybody talks about. Um, it means different things in different contexts, uh, and it means different things to different companies. 
Uh, we even have biohacking now. And I know in Paris there's a, is it, I forgot what it's called, La, La Palace or something, some biohacking space in, in Paris where people are given the opportunity just to experiment with you know, bio innovations. Um, so new, new innovative models. I mean, I think, you know, there's actually very little research on the benefits of these. But certainly everybody talks about them and, and um, they may or may not be one way forward. Uh, the other point here is about harnessing the power of uh, data. Um, you know, we all talk about big data without actually defining what it means, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to define it either. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the power of data, the power of data analytics is increasing exponentially. If we can find ways of gluing together those different sources of data, um, then potentially at least that is a way of short-circuiting some of that R&D process and, and, and improving the pace at which we bring ideas through research and development and, and prototyping and trials and, and so on. Um, um, Adoption and, and implementation then, the, the, the translation problem that I mentioned. Um, and a lot of this really is around the health system complexity. Uh, you know, we, we have very, very complex health systems uh, in developed countries. And I've been doing some work in Burkina Faso with, on, on malaria, on, on GM, mosquitoes and malaria. And I, I, went, I sort of started out naively thinking it'll be much simpler in Burkina Faso it's a kind of virgin territory. It's a you know rudimentary health system, but actually it's just as complex in terms of the way institutions, regulations, professional silos, funding silos work together within the health system. So we have very complex health systems, and getting innovations adopted faster requires us to think about how we organise healthcare. Right? I think, and take some of that complexity out of it. Um, but it also requires us to think about where we support innovators and, and support innovation. Um, and France, UK, US, all developed countries spend a lot of money supporting uh, research and development in medicine, in life sciences, uh, in medical engineering and so on. Um, but it's very skewed. It's a bit out of date now, but it won't have changed much. Those figures are from the UK, um, and it shows of the three billion or so pounds a year that are spent from public funds supporting healthcare innovation, the vast bulk of it goes on the early stages, the creation stage, and not on the rest of the pipeline, the translation of that research and development into practice, and supporting healthcare providers in actually taking up those innovations in the first place. Um, as I said, healthcare is immensely complex. Um, um, all those excuses, I'm sure you've heard all those. Um, uh, you know, if you go to a hospital, or primary care authority, try and sell your new idea, typically those are the kind of excuses you get. Um, and, uh, you know, talk all over the world, I've worked all over the world, and you tend to hear the same things again and again and again. Um, it's very easy to say no, because, you know, it's, it's, I like your idea, but I don't believe the evidence. We're different. Our hospital is different. We need to do our own trial, so come back to us with more evidence, for example. Um, so that, that complexity is a real, real barrier, I think, to um, innovation adoption. Um, and Things are beginning to move uh, slowly, I think, within the health system. Um, certainly in the UK now, there's a lot more emphasis on trying to integrate the different parts of the National Health Service and social care services in a way um, whereby everything is locally is within the same organisational structure. Um, and the problem at the moment in the UK and, and here is that it's so fragmented. You know, primary care is different from the hospital sector, which is different from social services, other out of hospital services. All of those is a budgetary silo. It's an organizational silo. 
and it makes it very, very difficult to deal with innovations which invariably have an effect across those different silos, those different organisational barriers. So in the UK now, the, most of the emphasis is on trying to redesign the NHS in a way that it's more integrated um, and, re and taking out some of those silos, sharing budgets um, and sharing the risk and reward of innovation, which is always the problem. The risk and the reward often falls in different budgetary si uh, silos within healthcare. Um, so things are slowly moving. We, we, we know what to do, at least. Doing it is another matter. Um, so, um, finally, on the third point, uh, the, the third sort of innovation challenge, is this point about um, cost inflation, technologically induced cost inflation in, in healthcare. Um, this is where the disruptive innovation question comes in. Um, and I guess most of you, a lot of you, probably would have heard of Clayton Christensen, in Harvard, um, wrote a book called Disruptive Innovation 20 years or so ago. Um, um, and there's been a lot of interest in that concept uh, and the way it's applied to different industries, but also healthcare. And, um, and essentially, without going into detail about, um, um, about what we mean by disruptive innovation, um, it, it's about simplification, it's about taking out the complexity it's about removing the over-specification. So Christensen, in his Harvard Business Review paper 17 years ago, said, look, you know, health systems are just too complex. Um, it's all focused around expensive procedures done by expensive individuals in expensive settings, hospitals. And we've got to drive that care out of hospital, into the community, um, get other people you know, give, give different types of healthcare professional the ability to deliver that care uh, and even drive it down to us as individuals and, and, and self-care. Um, so it's taking out that, that complexity and um, um, from, from that um, pretend Swiss army life. There. I did actually show this slide in Switzerland once when I was doing a talk. And I said, of course, nobody wants a Swiss army knife like that. And inevitably, somebody put his hand up in the audience and said, but I would really like one. <laughs> I'm Swiss. I would really like one. Um, so getting rid of that over-specification. And, and, and there are, there's a whole sort of, you know, I don't have time to go into the details of disruptive innovation in, in, in healthcare. Uh, but, you know, certainly the direction of travel for developed countries' health systems especially the UK, has been to try and do as much out of hospitals as possible. Use technology to support you doing that, telehealth, for example. Um, use new, you know, new diagnostic tools to, which are capable of being delivered out in the community. Um, but to shift care away from expensive settings. Um, but there's also a whole movement coming from uh, developing countries uh, where uh, th there's a movement to create versions of te technologies which are cheaper and simpler but good enough um, for use in, um, in those markets. Uh, this is very, very well known GE example, written, written up in numerous business school case studies and, um, and elsewhere. Um, but the interesting thing is that that cheaper, simpler, um, cheaper, simpler ECG uh, scanner is now being imported into developed health systems for use um, in, in, you know, out in the field. So it's a disruptive innovation here in, in Europe, for example. Um, so there's a whole movement towards frugal innovation um, in coming up from other countries. Um, and that's not just about physical technologies, it's about rethinking what we mean by hospitals, um, really innovating right across the entire ecosystem that makes up a hospital, the supply chain, how we design the hospital, you know, how we pay for services, how we use technology, and driving down costs that way. And again, some of those lessons are now here in Europe today. There, there are hospitals which have learnt from that in Europe. Um, so lastly, before I just conclude, um, um, I, you know, I, I would argue really that um, 
it, it's, it's not about the technology, really. The, the science and technology is really, really important. And of course it is to you, and it is to me as a patient as well. You know, I want the best technology if I'm ill. Um, but that science and technology needs to support innovation in other areas. Uh, this, this comes from a report that was done a year or so ago by the Health Foundation in the UK, which was trying to tackle this question of, you know, how do we do more for less, basically? How does the National Health Service cope with this, this onslaught of demand plus resource constraints? Um, um, you know, if we're not going to be spending 18% of GDP on healthcare, like, like the USA. Um, and it argues that there are different areas where we can innovate, um, um, but they have different impacts over time. And, and sort of, you know, the, the quick wins, this is working, but the quick wins are down the bottom there, and that's about sort of supply chain management, um, driving down cost, work, workforce management, and so on. But then as we move on over time, you know, we can start to redesign clinical pathways to improve the flow of patients. Um, we can shift funds from primary, uh, from, sorry, acute care, secondary care, into the primary care sector. And then later on, it's all about behaviour change. It's about getting us to lead healthier lives, you know, encouraging us to walk more, um, eat better, smoke less, drink less, and so on. But the payoff, of course, is, is in the future. Science and technology is in this report. You know, it's important, but it's a support for all these other areas of innovation, which is where the really big benefits will come. So, I think that's pretty well it. Um, just to conclude, so, um, <laughs> innovation in healthcare, what's the point? I mean, I, you know, it's kept me employed for 20 years or more. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happy. I've, I'm, I, and uh, did I mention there's a book as well? <laughs> you can buy the book. Um, um, but I think my key point really is that we, we need to take a more holistic perspective on uh, what we mean by innovation, um, it, it's, it's not just the technology. Um, there we are. I'm sure we can replace them with some uh, Donald Trump ones at some point. It's getting a bit dated, but it's, it's not just the technology, it's the organiser, you know, we, we really need to rethink how we deliver healthcare, how we organise it, um, how we pay for it, um, uh, and, and, and uh, that's where the really big benefits are coming. So, there we are. Finish. There's the book. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we now have a, a bit of time for questions, and maybe before I give the floor to you know one of you to kick off with a question, James, uh, you know, listening to you and let's sit down. Can you still see us? Yeah. Listening to you and the need for new thinking and frugal innovation and the examples from India. Um, we're mostly a European audience. Is anyone not from Europe? Yes, great. So mostly the <laughs> with the, you know, the yeah, one odd person. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you. Yes. So, you know, we're mostly a European audience, James. So what would you say looking five to ten years, you know, into the future? Where, sh where will new thinking come from? And what should we be aware of that we're not seeing today, you know, that may be coming from the side, from, you know, other parts of the world that is important for us to be aware of? Um, well, I think, um, I mean, ge geographically, um, I, I suspect over the next, you know, five, ten years, it, that the countries that are most powerful in terms of developing new innovations in healthcare will be the ones that, you know, are represented here and, and North America and Japan and so on, um, parts of East Asia. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think there are very interesting models emerging from uh, more resource poor parts of the world uh, where, they, you know, they, they, they do have to think about um, how you deliver healthcare universally, um, but do it in a way that is affordable. Um, um, and I think, what, what, you know, just as an aside, um, one of the dangers in a lot of those countries is. Um, that they just replicate 20th century models of care um, when they should really be using technology, mobile phones, for example, new diagnostics, 
point of care testing and so on, to leapfrog the old model, uh, you know, to do a truly 21st century model of healthcare. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I've seen many examples where they just want to build, you know, the, the big teaching hospitals. That, but of course, you need hospitals still, um, you know, bigger and better, and uh, um, and sort of replicate what we've got here, um, which is not sustainable. Um, so yes, anyway. So I think certainly there's interesting innovation coming from, you know, from India, from from Africa, from South America. Um, I think also, you know, I, I, as I said, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not the technology <laughs> that's the problem, actually. It, it is, you know, we need to grasp the nettle and really start to think about and have a debate about how healthcare is provided, um, how we pay for it, um, how we organise it. Um, and I can't see anybody really doing that at this stage. You know, the little sort of germs of nuggets of good ideas um, and you said at the beginning you know it's innovation is not necessarily new it's about borrowing stealing applying ideas to your own context um, and we certainly do that in the UK um, you know, a lot of talk about accountable care organizations ACOs uh, as part of the integrated care model you know so we're borrowing from the US uh, rightly or wrongly um, uh, so I think it's you know it's going to come from all over the place. Um, uh, I'd, I'd just say well, well, th there was a report um, that came out earlier this year, funded, uh, produced by other people at Imperial, not, not me, um, which interviewed 2,000 key opinion formers um, in healthcare in different countries around the world. And they, one of the questions they were asked was, um, where do you think the innovations are coming from? Where do you, you know, where do you draw your innovations from in your health system? And you know, the usual suspects were there. I mean, the UK was, and US and Germany were the three biggest, and Canada, I think. Um, but also India was, was, was a, a you know, major, major player. And that was geographically concentrated, so countries in South Asia, Africa, Middle East. We're looking to India in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Do we have uh, mics? Thank you. Thanks, James, for a um, great talk. So my name is Chris Sizer with PA Consulting. So we see lots of the stuff happening in the, in the UK. So my question to you is the, the role of the institutions. So kind of we live in a world where kind of we have manufacturer, producers, we've got payers, we've got providers, and we seem to be quite content in this world. So with ACOs, we see providers and payers getting closer together. But then if we see producers like pharmaceuticals getting closer to care provision, we say like, ooh, that's not where you should go. And on the other hand, I was at the similar session in Germany a couple of years ago when somebody from the German Liberal Party said like, hey, maybe as a government, we should take more the role of an innovator. And as liberals, we say, ooh, no, we shouldn't do this. So how do you see the roles evolving? Because they've been very classical and very rigid for the last, I don't know, 100 years. Um, yes, and I think one of the, one of the problems is that um, for countries where, which have had a, you know, a developed, advanced, publicly of a public health system, whether it's like the NHS in England or insurance model, um, f you know, for a country that's had that for a long, long time, and people have got used to, um, you know, high quality care, um, anything that's seen as shaking that up, and certainly any greater involvement of the private sector, uh, is often seen as, as, as you know, in, in, in detrimental terms and. Um, so it's actually very difficult to change things. You know, we, we've got this sort of um, path dependency problem. You know, certainly in the UK, where the National Health Service has been, you know, free at the point of delivery for 70 years or whatever it is now, um, and any talk about increasing role of, of private providers, um, let alone drug companies, is seen very negatively. Uh, of course, all GPs effectively are private individuals in, and private providers in the UK, so we sort of forget about that. Um, but I do think, um, you know, there are interesting examples of public-private partnerships emerging, certainly in Germany, um, in Finland, in the UK even, um, where 
uh, in, in Spain, the, the Alzira example in Spain, for example, um, where you know there, there are um, well-designed PPPs where um, risks and rewards are properly shared, properly worked out, um, and that that encourages innovation, innovative thinking. Um, so I think it can be done, um, and you know we're, I think most health systems will inevitably sort of move in that direction over time, but, but it's, it is difficult. Great. Thank you. Next question. Yes, in the back. So, um, thank you very much. Mm, Malina from Switzerland. I will perhaps shock you a little bit, but I think that uh, innovation is really about technology. We have bad technology for health care because we target the disease without knowledge how the disease develop. And we, uh, for 25 uh, years, we accepted that disease develop in aging because we have the bad gene. And it is not a true because I have found the technology, and my company is working on the, on the technology, uh, we, they, when uh, we have modified protein, the modified protein lead, lead to cell degeneration and to pathology. And this is the main problem for all diseases in aging, and also in infection. And you pointed very well that we have very big problem with antibiotic resistance, but nobody would like to change. I contacted a lot of big pharma, venture capitalists. They don't want to change. They would like the next antibiotic, but they don't want the new technology which just stop infection because your immunity is boost. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a hypocrisy that we have the technology to mm. stop infection, to, to uh, limit, uh, limit it, the use of antibiotic, but this technology is rejected. And also, the people with aging can stay healthy, just taking my molecule, uh, five micrograms per week, and unfortunately, no, nobody would like it, that uh, it will be on the market. I think there are, clearly there are a lot of vested interests that don't want to change things and, you know, new diagnostic point of care tests clearly have an impact on, you know, helping us to detect um, infections faster and that has a knock-on effect on, you know, demand for drugs. And so, so that, you know, that there are kind of inbuilt institutional vested interests that, 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 that um, mean things don't change, certainly. Um, I, I, you know, I, I agree with you. Um, I think the, I mean, the other point, I guess, and, and you'll know this better than me, perhaps, come from, particularly from the biotech and, and pharma sector, is that, I guess, the sort of low-hanging fruit, the kind of easy, you know, the easy <laughs> medical conditions have been researched and and we have solutions for those and what we're left with now are the more difficult difficult ones um you know associated with multiple comorbidities and and aging and all the rest of it so uh you know it, it is going to get more difficult i think to to, to innovate um uh, and and you know unless uh, unless we get better at the actual innovation process We'll take two more questions. I think someone was in the back, yes? And who would like to be the last question for this section? This session? Okay, so one here, one there. Sure. Uh, Gonzac Dutey from Nestle Skin Health. A very quick question, very basic, and uh, I know it's a very broad one. But how do you see uh, new players, such as uh, Google, going into healthcare? Uh, do you think they could become a, a key player in the future? And how do you see them, I mean, beating the crowd and eventually um, <coughs> compete versus the uh, big players and, and, and new med tech and uh, new companies? Basically, with what you know today, what is what you see today, mm. how do you see players such as Google? I, I, 
Well, I think they're clearly there, you know, waiting in the wings to come on stage. And, um, anyone from Google here? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I, I guess they've, you know, so far it's actually been rather difficult for those players to find, you know, what the business model is and where they insert themselves into incumbent existing health systems. Um, but c clearly, you know, they, they are a massively important force. Um, and I guess they're a force in terms of data and uh, they you know, collect huge amounts of data on our lifestyles, which clearly has a, you know, an impact on our understanding of wellness and uh, disease and um, potentially is able to be fed into the drug development process, perhaps. Um, uh, but, you know, I, as I say, I think they are, they're there, you know, they're, they're waiting. Thank you. So we have a question over here. You can pass the mic. We have two questions for the Q&A at the end of the presentations and also you know, tonight, this evening, around drinks. So thank you. I'm Sabin from Merck. And um, so I was in Cambridge a few months ago, and there was a lecture from Andrew Whitty, who retired from GSK. It was very good because he, he was talking about the innovation that is mainly driven by the, the, the high price market, US, Europe and uh, Japan. And he said that it's very, it's very interesting that we don't really think about the model. Everything is, is laid by price and those uh, targeted therapy. And he said, and that's my note, that we should rethink the value creation as a dimension of price, cost, volume, on, on time. And we are looking at new business model, for instance, where you pay as you go, for instance, like you pay for your mobile phone. And that, what do you think about those new business models? Because business model innovation is also a way to tackle that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think a lot of it, as I suggested at the end, I mean, a lot of it is about rethinking the business models for healthcare, you know, from whoever's perspective you're, you're looking. Um, but uh, certainly those pairs you go models are, 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 you know, being experimented with and I think a part of the <coughs> arsenal of, of new, innovative, um, uh, you know, organisational sort of uh, innovations for the future. So yes, I, I, I agree. Great. Well, thank you very much, James, for setting the stage for us. For this